Here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Les Le Bon Tom Roulet, the home opener, a mere 11 hours and 22 minutes away. So obviously preparations have been underway for days. Let the good times start rolling on a season of great expectations at LSU. But a big challenge to the opener is in come the inspired Hokies of Virginia Tech, ranked number nine. Coming up on College Game Day, how the beast of the Bayou, LSU's Glenn Dorsey, tackled childhood trauma to become college football's most feared defender. Can freshman Jimmy Clausen play without fear at Penn State tonight? How long and how low will the Irish go before it gets better? And Miami's head man has lived through very low times. He'll tell you how it's made him stronger. A visit with Randy Shannon. On a steamy day, College Game Day comes to Tiger Town for tonight's Top 10 Showdown. Well, we could do Oklahoma, Alabama, and through Georgia, trying to get on down to Florida for the game. And then we loaded up our tailgate, joined the convoy on the freeway, headed north to see them Buckeyes of Notre Dame. Sponsor of College Football's premier pregame show. Well, here in the state of Louisiana, the BCS championship game will be played four months from now. Just a short drive to New Orleans. I know it's a long time from now, a lot of hurdles for LSU, but they can clear a big one tonight. As in come the Hokies, ranked number nine, but there is supreme confidence in all quarters. On the radio down here, fans are talking about shutting out Virginia Tech, <laughs> giving the visiting Hokies absolutely no, no chance. Yeah. I think this crowd believes that. We'll see if the Tigers take him lightly. Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, Kirk Kerbstreet, Desmond Howard will join us. Our first visit down here in three years. Always a fun place to be. I love it here because I get some pralines. You know, I, I have to say, of all the places we go, it's the best tailgating and some of the best food Ooh, in the yeah. country. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is the crowd we're used to seeing. Last week, warm, fuzzy, respectful. This week, back to normal. They ask the crowd to be very, very polite to Virginia Tech. They will honor two victims of the shootings who were involved in Katrina yeah. relief. We'll see how long their respect lasts. Virginia Tech, of course, is just a week removed from that powerful, poignant moment in their opener. Tears, cheers, and also anxiety as the Hokies often struggled in all phases. A wake-up call, said Sean Glenn on the quarterback. It won't fly in Baton Rouge. The O-line woes creating anxiety, altering game plans, and inspiring confidence in this LSU defense. They pounced on Mississippi State, swarmed. They can crush a quarterback psyche very quickly. Comanche in waves. Even the backups are beasts, and the Hokies are very thin in the offensive line. But Tech has a good defense, too. If you like your football where the yards and the first downs are hard-earned, you're going to love this game tonight. Only the third time in the history of Tiger Stadium, there's a top-ten matchup involving a non-conference opponent. The last time, 87 Ohio State, featuring a DB named Bo Pelini, who's the Tigers' defensive coordinator. This is just one of the games involving national title contenders like LSU, Virginia Tech, Texas, Oklahoma, Georgia, Penn State, with a flat, sloppy performances this week 
are not going to cut it, and they're also not expected. Now, besides the Appalachian State epic upset, it was pretty formful in week one. We're going to have to see if some visiting teams can step up and provide some surprises today. You know, from a coaching standpoint, there's a lot to learn that can help you for the rest of the year from your football teams. LSU, let's take example. Everybody knows they got a national title defense. How their offense can block Virginia Tech's SEC-type defense and players will determine how good their offense. And from Virginia Tech, your Virginia Tech staff's going to find out how many competitors they got. Because, Kirk, they're not going to play a better team in a more hostile environment anywhere in the country from now on than this place. And remember one thing. Everything now on the road is downhill from here. Oh, there's no doubt about oh. that. And Sean Glennon, I think, is the big key in how he handles the crowd. You know, from a, if you look at the, the entire college football landscape, the one thing to me that I'm, I'm interested in, coaches always talk about from week one to week two, you see the most improvement. Last week, we saw big upsets. This week, I want to see if the arrogance of the big-time programs, they look down at teams from those smaller conferences that a lot of times they get snuck up on. Today, Nebraska, Wake Forest, Texas, TCU, Alabama, and Vanderbilt. Will that arrogance? Even though their coaches are warning them against it, respect these teams. Players don't always listen, as we saw last week. Will they learn and listen and be ready to play this week, or are we going to see some more upsets? Well, but besides Appalachian State, though, there weren't very many upsets last week. It was the, the, the experts took a beating, so I'm, I'm very interested to see if anyone on this set has the courage to pick a couple of upsets coming up in the show. I'm going to be watching to, just we'll to see, see we'll who see. steps out there. We got a lot of show to play. A lot of Absolutely. show. We'll also talk about the Hokie that had the courage to trash chuck against Glenn Dorsey the fierce pass rusher will feature him coming up in college game day and also talk plenty about the beginning of our doubleheader in prime time tonight of course the game in Happy Valley where the big story is the true freshman Jimmy Clausen everybody says he is special he's going to have to be special to cope with that defense and that environment at Happy Valley Fighting Irish could use some fight. Can the young guy do it for Charlie Weiss? He's got a gunslinger he's comfortable with. But we'll see you. It's up the Longhorns next. And the highlight of the show, wait till you see how South Carolina head coach Steve Spur is using our man, Mr. Corso, to psych up his crowd and his team. Game day is built by the Home Depot and in part by Kingsford Charcoal. This game day, grab your friends and family and fire up the grill. It's time to bring the tailgate home. And Pontiac, official performance machines of the NCAA. Welcome back to Baton Rouge. Have you mentioned that it is steamy here? That it is really steamy? They're saying an excellent chance of rain in the afternoon. They're yeah. hoping it's going to clear out before the kickoff at 8.15 yeah. local time. But very important for all involved to stay hydrated. That's Stage absolutely. left is a puddle over. This is yeah, the place done. where the air conditioning was invented for our show. <laughs> secret here. We have the, we have the hose. My hand is right here. It's, it's not working. <laughs> but that's only part of the hostile environment for the yeah. Hokies tonight. All around the country today on our Saturday slate, you got visiting teams coming into places where it's very, very tough to win, including yeah. that crowd up at Happy Valley. Well, if you're a freshman quarterback and you're trying to go to Happy Valley, it makes it very tough. If we, as we've talked about all week, Notre Dame, Penn State, Jimmy Clausen, gets his first start. Is he ready for the atmosphere? Is he ready for the speed of Tom Bradley's defense? Tom Bradley will try to confuse him with a lot of different looks. So it'll be interesting to see how Clawson handles that. And by the way, Anthony Morelli, I think, is going to lead Penn State to a Big Ten championship. He got off to a great start last week. How about Oregon and Michigan? Michigan scored 32 last week, still lost. Number seven, Chad Henning will throw touchdowns. Number 20, Michael Hart will establish the run. I think today the Big Blue will rally and outscore Oregon. They might have to do a lot of touchdowns to beat them. Well, meanwhile, a noon ABC game. It's kind of an 80s throwback game. Miami visits Oklahoma. Rain is expected. The Sooner defense looked average against non-conference foes last year. Expect to dominate more this year. Five touchdown debut. The freak DeMarco Murray joined by Alan Patrick, who is back healthy today. Miami got to get Craig Cooper, this rookie running back. He's got to oh, step nice. up, share the load with Javaris James, take the pressure off Freeman. Later today on ESPN2, South Carolina and Georgia, an SEC game. Corey Boyd's got to get on track, take some of the pressure off of the passing game. I was really impressed last week with Georgia's defense. I thought they made a statement with so many new players starting. And Matthew Stafford, much like Anthony Morelli, I think is on his way to a big year as his second year as a starter. How about Nebraska at Wake Forest? Nebraska 
Nebraska's West Coast ball offense is finally clicking. Number five, Sam Keller to number 20, Marlon Lucky coming out of the backfield. And this guy, Lucky, can really run the football. Offensive balance is now Nebraska's strength. They're no longer just three yards in a cloud of dust. It's a nice-looking football team. Wake at the backup quarterback there. Huge red-letter landmark game for TCU at Texas. All-American Tommy Blake gives him a lift. He returns to defensive end to harass Colt McCoy. The Frogs just don't let teams run the ball. They just don't. The last 17 opponents average 56 yards. Texas shaky on offense in the opening game. It's tough to run against them. Mac Brown says you got to pass to beat him. That's what he plans to do. The Frogs offense shut out Baylor last week. They get five straight over Big 12 teams. Only OU has won more consecutive over conference teams. The Frogs allow less than nine points per game during that streak. The signature win at Norman certainly got the attention of the Longhorns who struggled against Arkansas State. They were outgained. I mean, they had a lot of penalties. That was an issue. Arizona or Arkansas State missed a couple of field goals, had a pick, or they might have actually shocked the Longhorns. Mac Brown says it wasn't complacency or lack of effort, but he told me there is no way he can make his guys believe that this TCU game is as big, means as much to Texas as it does to TCU. He's going to have to win it on talent and execution. Aaron Brown, by the way, the running back for the Horned Frogs, he is out. He's a big-time back, and he's not going to play today. Remember, most of the TCU players were not heavily recruited by the University of Texas. So they got a chip on their shoulder, but they can play defense. But I still think, Kirk, that Texas is winning this ball game. They're going to rally in the fourth quarter, and they're going to do it the forward pass. Texas closer than the experts think in a really good ball game. I think we all see the same thing. You know, I, yeah. I think you think about TCU, and you have a lot of respect for Gary Patterson. What Lee and Chris, Lee and Chris just talked about, all very good points, because you have a TCU team that comes in hungry. You have a TCU team with players looking to prove themselves. You have Texas trying to match that enthusiasm. End of the day, TCU's defense is ready for this game. They're ready to compete. They'll keep it close. They just don't have the, the weapons on offense. With Brown down, Texas will win this game. And the other thing that hurts TCU is the fact that they beat Oklahoma a couple years in Norman. That catches everybody's attention, especially these Texas players. Mac Brown won't have to work as hard to get his guys yeah. to understand how good TCU is because of what they did in Norman a couple years ago. I shouldn't have to. That game is the only other game today besides the one here in Baton Rouge involving two ranked teams. TCU is legit. You say close, but not quite enough. Closer than the experts. I'm just going to put a sweat towel right over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go in the air-conditioned Home Depot bus. Oh, the guy is it, Des? The guy who's loving life right now is Desmond Howard. We invite you to go on ESPN.com. You can chat with Desmond throughout the show. He'll tell us what's on the mind of the viewers. I imagine. It's cozy. Yeah, Desmond, I imagine there's a lot of Notre Dame, Penn State talk probably out there. It really is. It's the hot topic right now, and people don't think that Jimmy Claus is going to play too well this evening, but it's still early, so everyone jump online. I'd love to hear from you, and hey, Chris, I'll check with you later in the show, give you some feedback, but until then, my friend, stay cool. <laughs> oh, my man, it's impossible out. It's oh, impossible. That's, right. that's, that's not right. That's nice stuff. I'll tell you what, Weiss has more confidence than the people on ESPN.com about Claus, and we'll talk much more about that coming up. But these guys think Nebraska is going to be looking past Wake Forest today and ahead to the showdown with USC next Saturday night. And looking to shake off the week one debacles, find out why the road doesn't get any easier for Notre Dame and Michigan. What will the Irish record be after USC comes to that? How ugly will it get? We'll talk about it. And welcome back to Baton Rouge College Game Day. This year presented in high definition. Tell you what, there's an interesting game following us. Nebraska visiting Wake Forest. It's a much tougher game than when the game was first scheduled. Only one of these teams has won a conference title this century, and it's not the Big Red. Wake, though, doesn't ask that Matt Ryan shredded for five touchdowns and 4.08. Marlon Lucky is a weapon catching the football and running it. So Bill Callahan's offense expects to have a big day. He's the hug five in Winston-Salem. There still is concern, though, about stopping Wake Forest. They can play offense. It's a tough scheme right there. And any chance that Nebraska might not be completely focused for this ball game with USC in a very, very anticipated game in Lincoln next week. Any chance? Well, I think this is one of those games I talked about earlier where you, you have a team with a coach that's saying, guys, listen, now Wake Forest can play football. They're experienced. They got to the ACC championship game last week. But these US, you know, the Nebraska players are thinking about USC. They're thinking about the opportunity to play USC at home. They have to guard against that. I think there's a potential letdown. I think Nebraska wins the game. I think Sam Keller needs one more rehearsal before he gets ready for SC. They definitely 
definitely will be looking ahead, yes. thinking about SC. It'll catch them early, but eventually they're too strong in the trenches to lose this game. But Wake will battle. I agree with you 100%. I'm going to give you three reasons why. First of all, Nebraska is playing in the smallest stadium they played in in the last 36 yep. years. Mm, not All good. Asleep. Hey, Wake Forest is the third losing program in the history of college football. Not good. And they got number one USC coming at home. Nebraska is lucky to win this one. It's going to be really close because for those pun? three reasons, is that man. that a pun, Marlon Lucky? I'm telling you, they're going to be Marlon Lucky, and they're going to be <laughs> lucky <laughs> by that. Pretty been a great week for Bill Callahan. He got an extension. He now goes through 2012, 1.75 million. So that puts him 17th in the country, fourth in the conference. Don't get complacent. <laughs> Speaking of uh, of coaches, well, Tom O'Brien returns to Chestnut Hill coaching NC State. Face the team that he built into a top 25 bowl program. NC State does not look like a bowl team this year. They're light years from a bowl team. And here comes Ryan, who wants to keep building his draft stock off that superb opener. Boston, but they certainly don't want to lose to him. And Ryan, meanwhile, off to a great start. One of the few college quarterbacks who's calling his own plays at times, even in the hurry up. He just loves doing that. And you can see the monster game. Yeah, a certain first rounder if he keeps this up. NC State will not have either starting defensive tackle. Be very, very unpredictable. It started in week one. You've had teams like Virginia Tech when they weren't expected to. Wake Forest last year win the conference title. What do we learn out of week one out of this very unpredictable conference? Either Georgia Tech is a tremendous football team or Notre Dame is lousy. That's what we learned the first <laughs> week. But I think Georgia Tech's really good. But the thing I learned also is about Florida State. Florida State was clobbered in the first half and embarrassed. And they came back and made a game and almost won. I'm not so sure of last year's Florida State team wouldn't have quit. This one did not quit. Came that's, that's an interesting point. We'll have to stay tuned to see if that continues to grow for them on that side of the ball. The thing that I saw in week one with the ACC is Clemson, we get it. I mean, if, if it's a primetime game, the crowd's there, the TV's there, everybody gets excited. You can play noon kick. Can you take it to the next level? Can you show up when nobody cares about the game and take it to the next level? That's when Clemson gets respected nationally, when they can do it consistently and not just in a high-profile game. That's what I learned about Clemson. We'll see if they're ready for that in a few weeks. I'm with the lead. Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, the teams to beat not only in that division, but I think in the ACC. That Georgia Tech defense is very good. Yellow Jackets will host Clemson, by the way, at the end of the month. And I'm with you. I totally agree. Florida State will be much better at offense, score a lot more points as long as the opponent keep snappers are in business here <laughs> these folks are interested they'll, they'll watch the mighty Knowles office because Jimbo Fisher yeah the former coordinator yeah. he looks upset off from Baton Rouge and he, he went to Tallahassee got a little air time. I think he, he got a little popped yeah a little pop from Bobby Bowden huh? yeah he did yeah, he post -game. Game. all right a lot more coming up on college game now a lot more touches as well the Irish frowning last week <laughs> former Notre Dame head coach Lou Holtz tells us how many wins Charlie Weiss the company you're gonna have after eight games and Go to the extremes to get his team ready to face their bitter rivals, the Georgia Bulldogs. What is the head ball coach making Lee Corso a part of his big plan? We'll tell you why. Well, a great doubleheader begins at 6 o'clock Eastern time. Notre Dame and Penn State from Happy Valley. Roaring for revenge down there, all dressed in white. Then, right after that game, Virginia Tech and LSU here in Baton Rouge. Well, it should be a great atmosphere in Penn State, one of the all-time tough environments for a true freshman quarterback making his starting debut. More on Jimmy Clausen's baptism coming up. Charlie Weiss has much more faith in his trigger man than the odds makers who make Notre Dame a 17-point underdog for only the second time in 10 years. Then again, the Irish limp in on a three-game skid, losing by 20, 27, and 30 to SC, LSU. They're chanting overrated here. And Georgia Tech, the last five times the Irish lost by 30 or more, well, they lost four of the next five times. So the win was against Navy, though. Sorry, Irish fans, in light of the challenge that lies ahead, we must revisit the sobering and, to quote Weiss, sickening carnage from ND's worst home opener ever. Touchdown, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech extends to a 32-3 to lead. What was going through your mind as you were watching the film? I wanted to vomit. I don't think any of them should feel comfortable with how we played last week. Eight-yard loss of the sack. Every one of those blitzes were practiced about 100 times. So obviously we should have practiced 101. Eight sacks today for Georgia Tech. When you know what they're doing and then you don't handle it, that's even a bigger problem than when you don't know what they're doing. Don't do trouble, the ball. Uh, I'm not 
not looking to play musical quarterbacks. I'm very excited and proud to say it. I'll be attending the University of Notre Dame. Jimmy Clausen's going to be our starting quarterback for the Penn State game. I think he's ready to run the offense. He was always ready mentally. His arms missed the best chance of winning. Well, you know a lot about Casey Clausen. He's almost 20 years old, born out there in California. Jimmy looks a lot different now. His brother Casey and Rick will both be there in attendance in Happy Valley today. Jimmy, 42-0 as a starter in high school. Very successful recruits in the country when he committed to Notre Dame in 2006. Arrived in the limo, you know, all that stuff. And he had a smile on his face last week. He went in in relief. He was pretty efficient. Weiss says, are you ready? And he says, I've been ready. But finally, his arm, after that off-season elbow surgery there, is just back to 100%. So we bring in Lou Holtz, who had very high expectations for the Irish Camino this season. Obviously, Charlie believes that Clawson gives him the best chance to win, Lou. But what are your expectations tonight for Clawson in a very tough environment? Oh, I think he's going to be an excellent quarterback. It's a question of when. It may be today. It may be at the end of the year. When I saw him in the spring game, I was really impressed. And talking to Charlie Weiss, he has everything that Brady Quinn has. He has talent. He has ability. He has experience. The one thing, Charlie can name him the starting quarterback. What he cannot do is he cannot name him the leader. Titles come from above. Leaders will be determined by the players. The minute the players accept him as a leader, I think everything will turn around for Notre Dame. And I also want to mention this. Casey Clawson beat us a couple times in the last minute. When I said South Carolina, he's going to be great, but he will be great. And they also know about Rick Clawson down here. He spent some time at LSU. I guess Weiss figures, why not? Make the debut tonight because it just gets tougher and tougher for Notre Dame. They visit the big house next week. Michigan State's at home, then at Purdue, at UCLA. You know what the Bruins defense did last year to Notre Dame? BC and USC at home. So those are the first eight games. Lou, you said they might win 11. Are you selling Notre Dame stock after the upset loss at home to Georgia Tech last week? No, I'm really not, and I'm not being a Pollyanna on this, but, you know, there were a lot of positive things last week. I think if they win one of the next two games, they will win eight football games. And so why do I say it? Number one, I was impressed with their defense. They played much better. They were on the field almost the whole game, and they did force five field goal attempts. I thought their secondary played better. You look at them on offense. They have three starting linemen coming back, excellent linemen. I'm talking about Sullivan and Sam Young and Turkovic. They have an excellent tight end in Carlson. They have two fine young running backs that can break it open on our, and Armando Allen and James Aldridge. All they need is a quarterback. And I think that once they find it, once he becomes a leader of that football team, they're going to be a very solid football team, but they're a year away. I think 2008, they're going to be awesome. Well, let's take a look at uh, Irish and don't forget, forget emotion in this situation. I want to bring up some facts. Offensively, the quarterback and the running back position they brought back this year had 288 yards of total offense in their career and scored two touchdowns. That's an 0-0. The offensive line lost 333 starts from last year. That's an 0-0. The defense gave up 33 points to Georgia Tech where they gave up 10 last year. That's an 0-0. A lot of 0-0s. They'll be lucky to win one out of eight. I said at the year. What? One yeah, out of eight? One out of eight. I said at the year they would win six, right? Yep. They'll win the last four. I'm not so sure that I'm only going to win five. They'll be lucky to win one out of the next eight. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of talk this week, Lee, about Jimmy Clausen. And you know what it's like being a coach and, and putting a true yeah. freshman on the field, under center, on the road in a tough environment. The one thing I want to say about Jimmy Clausen, remember, he's not a typical true freshman trying to come in. Granted, it's going to be very tough for him to execute. This guy was on campus in South Bend in January. Went through spring ball, has had an opportunity to get a little bit more acclimated athlete than your typical true freshman who shows up in August and has four weeks to get ready. So he went through spring. I know he's had some injuries to deal with, but he's been around. It gives him a little, it's almost like he's a red shirt freshman coming in as opposed to being a true freshman. Now with that said, looking at these first eight games, and I felt this team had a chance to get to seven or eight by the end of the year after watching him in week one. I know Charlie Weiss doesn't like to talk about rebuilding, but it is clearly a rebuilding year in this transition period. I think they split with Michigan State and Purdue. I think they can beat Boston College at home. I think two wins in their first eight is just being realistic. Two and six. Two and seven. And you say maybe one and seven? One and seven. We'll see if Clawson could be a quick fix. It's the earliest in the season start for a freshman quarterback at Notre Dame since 1951. Lou, what do you think? They're big, big underdogs, which is a rarity at Notre Dame. Can they pull the upset tonight in Happy Valley? 
Well, it's the hardest place in the world to break any young quarterback. Yeah, I think they're capable of it, but their defense is going to have to play outstanding. Is that a prediction, or is that a qualified? Do, do they win the game? Well, I, I, I think, yeah, I think that they're capable <laughs> oh. of winning the football game because somebody hadn't done it. Doesn't mean they can't do it. As Dale Roy used to say, if a dog's going to bite you, he'll do it as a pup. Bite if a guy's going to be a great player, he'll be a great player. No, as I hear a you. But you're stopping yes. short of calling for the Irish win. You're just kind of they have a chance. I, I think they have a chance. I, and, uh, yeah, I think they're <laughs> capable of pulling you up. So would I predict right. would I bet my life on it? You win. Yeah, probably you win. You win. I give up. I give up. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. <laughs> give up. Lou. Let's, go, <laughs> let's go inside the bus to Desmond. I know, wait, that the, uh, I know that there are more strong opinions by, by people online, Desmond. What do you got? Everyone loves the pressure you just put on Lou Holtz online. They're <laughs> <laughs> digging that. Now, a lot of people are saying that they think that, P that Penn State is going to make them draw a goose egg, that Notre Dame won't even score a point. Now, I don't buy that. I think that Clawson is going to do a good job. I think they're going to put him in positions to manage the game as best as they can. But they can't to that play after play. It's going to break your defense. I think Penn State will win, but in a much closer contest than we saw in South Bend last Saturday. All right, Desmond, we'll talk more about the uh, Penn State Notre Dame game. If you go to your AT&T wire, bring you confessions of a college football junkie. That's one of the topics we'll tackle. Also, the best tailgate spot. Ooh. It's Baton Rouge. Penn State fans, they got a great tailgate spot. We'll talk more about the Nittany Lions and the Irish. The big picture, what it looks like. We'll hear from Jopa and Weiss. Plus, they won't soon forget the day they beat Michigan. Appalachian State officially on the map. We'll help you find them. I'm Caitlin Upton, Miss South Carolina Team USA, coming up on ESPN's College Game Day. I'm going to show you Appalachian State's place on the map. Yeah, we're coming to Now we got to show you another look to the playable that we remembered forever. Appalachian State, Armonte Edwards, the quarterback, he put in hard, gave Michigan the lead. Looked like the Big Blue might dodge the upset through the big pass. Appalachian State went ahead, but left Michigan some time. Could have been a mistake. Manningham got deep, but then Gary Lynch upset in the big house. LSU was supposed to play Appalachian State. They dodged him. They dodged him, but look out. Here come the Mountaineers into 2009. By the way, they're cheering Appalachian State. They're that job. Keep that in mind. Meanwhile, at Appalachian State, it's an historic stone sellout in Boone as in comes Division II Lenore Ryan. Appalachian State merchandise is back ordered for weeks online. The school's website, the hits are up 5,000%. And Chancellor Ken Peacock is selling prospective students who would consider UNC Chapel Hill. Why stop at the hill when you can come all the way to the mountain? Appalachian State is hot, 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 especially on YouTube. But... It's a little bit hard to find unless you know where to look. <laughs> so Tom Rinaldi breaks out the map. By now, the entire nation knows where the Appalachian State Mountaineers were a week ago. Ah! The Mountaineers have just beat the Michigan Wolverines! The Mountaineers of Appalachian State have just beat Michigan Wolverines in the big house! Oh, unbelievable! But where exactly did they come from? Where is Appalachian State? Where is Appalachian State? If most people didn't know where Appalachian State was a week ago, it's understandable. And I didn't know anything about Appalachian State. I couldn't spell it, couldn't pronounce it, didn't know where it was. I thought it was in uh, North Georgia, in the mountains. <laughs> I guess some people never heard of it. In Michigan, nobody seemed to know where it was. Even a future Appalachian State freshman, Miss Teen South Carolina, struggled, somewhat famously, to explain our national ignorance of such geography. People out there in our nation don't have maps, and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as. Uh, okay, we'll get to the map later. Let's start with where App State, as it's known here, plays its games. Kid Brewer Stadium, known as The Rock. It's roughly 90,000 seats smaller than Michigan Stadium. And if most college football fans don't know much about The Rock... It's short on schedule Appalachian State, I'll tell you that. <laughs> People don't realize how good they are. That's it. You know, I've won that back-to-back double-A championship in a row. We know we're not a 1A school. But we don't think of ourselves as a uh, cream puff. The Mountaineers' trip led them to a team with 22 more scholarships, millions more in athletic budget, and volumes more in history. 
All App State had in the end was more points. It's going to sound pretty cocky, I think, kind of deservingly so. Uh, our, our kids played hard. It was not a fluke. We beat Michigan. And you look at anything, and that is a fact. That's a complete sentence now. And all the English grammar you got, that's a complete sentence. It is a moment which put Appalachian State in the atlas of great upsets, on the landscape of inspiration, and at the heart of any football map that matters. So, to finally answer the question, where is Appalachian State? Who else would we ask? Where is Appalachian State? Everybody knows that. App State is located right here in Boone, North Carolina, named after the pioneer Daniel Boone. Go Mountaineers. Woo! They're getting national love, and Michigan is taking shots. I don't understand this one. That's Nick Saban holding money bags. Okay, he got paid a four million bucks by Alabama, but he's in a Michigan, Michigan shirt. <laughs> I don't get that. He coached Michigan State, folks. He's not going to Michigan. Michigan. Okay. There's other candidates for that job. I say nothing. Michigan <laughs> and Lenore Ryan. There's a little bit of a contrast there. Slight difference in stadium capacity enrollment. Slightly smaller Lenore Ryan. They're Division II. They have, you know, 35 scholarships there. Fred Goldsmith, the last coach to take Duke to a bowl game, he coaches Lenore Ryan. Back to Appalachian State, you know, Jerry Moore in that spread offense. He visited with Urban Meyer in the offseason. It's a very tough offense to stop. And with more 1AA teams going to that, are we going to see more shockers like this? Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, the other 1A versus 1AA or championship versus bowl subdivision and all that nonsense, the average score last week, 53-7. to 7. So the, the huge exception was a Michigan game. Is it going to be a trend or a no, one-off? No, no, no. This is not going to be a trend. This is a once-in-a-lifetime experience when you see a team like this knock off Michigan. Now, with that said, the spread, Lee, you know from your days yeah. of coaching, the wishbone or the veer is kind of an equalizer. A team like Air Force, need, even today, needs something yeah. to be an equalizer to help them compete against bigger, more powerful, faster teams. And that's what Appy State did in this game. They spread Michigan's defense out Perfect. and exposed them with an athletic quarterback and that's what the spread can do. This game? Yes. So Appalachian State beat Michigan. So what? It's like Chicken Little getting hit on the hip. It's like a meteor hitting the earth every 100,000 years. <laughs> it ain't going to happen again for at least 10,000 years at the Michigan level. And I'm going to tell you why. Every coach is going to say to their players, Remember, at Chicken Little, the sky's Did not falling. Well, you see that movie? Yes, it's I great. It was very I mean, the kids good. like it, don't they? The next time it happens, I'm going to say to you, remember Appalachian State. Hey, not 10,000 years. I'll be years. dead by that time that thing happens. Yeah. All right, well, UMass, the team that <laughs> lost him. the 1AA championship game to yeah. Appalachian State, they take on a few weeks. Furman at Clemson. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but no. it will not be it's the not last trend, time in 10,000 times. By the way, the AP poll clarified their rule. It's now... Perfectly okay to vote for a one double A team yeah. in your poll if you see fit. And I don't think any voters. <laughs> a lot more coming up on college game day. <laughs> Michigan, can they bounce back from the once in 10,000 year loss that uh, Lee is talking about? We'll reveal why it's uh, what it's going to take. Desmond Howard, meanwhile, will take us out of the demo field. Desmond. And when we come back, I'm going to demonstrate how Virginia Tech's Sean Dunn is going to try to handle this LSU crowd noise. <laughs> Welcome back to Baton Rouge. LSU fans asked to be full tonight to the Hokies. Could not be a bigger contrast, though, the warm embrace of their home fans a week ago and the very powerful postscript, the Sunday morning taking of the game ball of the win over East Carolina to the monument where the 32 stones honoring the victims of the shootings are on campus. So the Hokies faithful, some of them made the trip here, and LSU fans will be respectful, but they'll also be very loud and very tough on this team. And Frank Beamer knows that emotion and inspiration alone are going to fall far short of getting the job done here tonight. are going to have to play much, much better and manage those emotions. Well, first of all, they'll be very emotional and really thinking about everything until LSU hits them in the mouth. Then it's survival. I'm telling you, I've had football teams really emotional until they start getting the crap kicked out of them, and then it's like... Get out of yeah, here real you know, quick. You know I what I mean? I think the emotions were a factor for Virginia Tech last, last week. week. With all due respect to East Carolina, there was so much build up to into that football game off the field, away from football, that those Virginia Tech players had to deal with. I think that was a release for them. I think this week, and in fact, if you're lifting weights in the offseason, you're thinking about the upcoming season, you're a Virginia Tech player, you're thinking about LSU and the challenge of going to Baton Rouge. With all due respect to Skip Holtz in East Carolina, <laughs> that's been the motivation, yeah. and now it's here. I, I think they'll yeah. be focused much more this week. You know, Hokies got him in 
an 0-2 with the crowd and the special teams plays. And Frank Beamer said he tried to push off this game in Baton Rouge as long as he could. And then he said this week, the bill has come due. <laughs> I don't know confidence that inspired. It's right. very, very tough, as you know, to play in Baton Rouge. They roll in with a home win streak of 13. One game under Les Miles here. If you go back to the last 24 LSU home games, they have won 23 of them. Normally, they do a very suffocating defense. 12 held to 17 points or less. The noise is part of that. The nasty defense is the bigger part of that. At home last year, 29 sacks. They average almost said they don't like a lot of noise, like for example, Virginia Tech's Sean Glennon. It's fun going into a hostile environment uh, against a, you know, I was number two team in the country and, and playing in games like that. You know, it's a lot of fun playing at home, you know, having a crowd behind you, but sometimes it's just as much fun to go into an environment like that and kind of have the odds against you. Well, Glennon had his spirits lifted after kind of a tough start for him. A phone call from Tom Brady. Superstar Patriots quarterback that's a little bit sensitive, maybe more aware than he ought to be of his critics and certainly the crowd noise, and that's going to be a real problem tonight if he's not a little less sensitive. Yeah, he's really uh, aware of it. I spoke with him earlier this week, and he said the crowd noise here can be deafening. But I'm going to give you a demonstration of how he's going to try to handle that. Now, he breaks the huddle, right? He comes to the line. Now, I have my guys set up. These are my offensive linemen, my wide receiver, and my running back. He sees that Glenn Dorsey's this guy who's injured because he has a messed up hand. The crowd goes crazy. They don't want them to audible. But now he has to bend down, tell the center to play. The center passes it down the line, runs back, tells the running back to play, and he gives a signal to the wide out. He gives it back, and now he goes with a silent count from the center by just tapping it with the ball. Go! He drops back, fakes it, throws it to the guy. Now, we all know, fellas, that, hey, getting to the right play, that may be a challenge, but the real drama starts once the ball is snapped, and he has Glenn Dorsey and those boys breathing down his neck. Yeah, I'm worried about that, Des, but if he's going on the first one. Right? Yeah, I, you know, there's so many things that go into playing on the road when you're a quarterback. Sean Glennon, first of all, has 14 career starts. He's been to the Orange Bowl when it's been a big game, played against Georgia last year in a bowl game, uh, and, and I think he understands what it takes. I think Brian Steinspring, the offensive coordinator, is very aware of these kind of circumstances. Big thing is you got to mix things up. You can't just sit there and allow the LSU defense to tee off on you. <laughs> Lee, you do little yep. things. You mix up the snap count. Good point. You, you have to try to get your quarterback away from the pressure yeah. there's things you have to do and the other thing is getting first downs <laughs> and you know just one first down yeah, and punt don't self-destruct. If he turns the ball over, the game's over, and it's an avalanche. You, you know, I had, a, I had a real good experience. I coached in this place right here. How'd you do? Actually, I'll tell you what. Let me tell you <laughs> a second. I got LSU at a chance when they had urgency and redemption going for them. I beat them 24-21 in Bloomington and had to come back up here and play them. And let me tell you what we learned. Quarterback and read his lips for the signal. Number two, we went on a quick count, like you said, before they could get set. And most important, we didn't screw around too much. With all of this stuff, it screws up the offense twice as much as it does the defense. And they will, if Virginia Tech worries about the crowd knows, they won't score a point tonight. Well, the noise and the speed of LSU's defense in the pass rush knock some of those guys out of their comfort zone. Yeah, tonight. you're right. We'll keep an eye on that. It'll be all happening inside Tiger Stadium. You can see it in the back half of the doubleheader right after Notre Dame and Penn State. Virginia Tech and LSU kick off about 9.15. Eastern time. Kickoff closing in in Norman for Miami and the Sooners. His life off the field certainly prepared him for anything on it. Now Miami head coach Randy Shannon stays focused on family and team no matter what. We got a short, crisp practice today. No, move. No walking. Move. Quick, Joe. Speed. Speed is the key. Come on. Speed. College game day is built by the Home Depot and in part by Hummer like nothing else. And Edward Jones, making sense of investing. We've talked about young quarterbacks having to step up today. Sam Bradford at Oklahoma had his first career start. was a laugher against North Texas. Today he steps up against the Hurricanes defense. High hopes for this guy. He's been very impressive in practice. We'll see if he's up to it under the bright lights. That game coming up noon on ABC. And, of course, this is the reunion of a tremendous Rivalry. Miami and Oklahoma have gone at it. They haven't played, though, since the 80s. Wow. And there's a salute over in Norman against the Hurricanes from those years because Miami usually got the better of them. Steve Walsh to Michael Irvin with a touchdown. 88 Orange Bowl game. 
Jim Johnson and the Hurricanes upset number one Oklahoma 20 to 14. That game was very sweet because two years earlier, Vinny Testaverde threw to Michael Irvin. They won the game, but they blew that Oklahoma won the national title that year. In 85, Testaverde again, too much for the suitors. This game was in Norman. You see why he didn't make a living running the football, but the number three Oklahoma 27 to 14. And one of the tough defensive linemen or defensive players on those a late 80s Miami teams is linebacker Randy Shannon, of course, who's now head coach and faces his first real test as head coach. But no tough game, no adversity on the field could ever compare to what Shannon has overcome in his life off the field. And no loss, however humbling, however heartbreaking, could compare with the losses that Shannon's already experienced in his life. Joe Shad has his story. Death, drugs, projects, trials and tribulations. Complex, difficult. I grew up quickly. The world isn't fair, fair, fair. Against the warm sky of Liberty City, Florida, in urban Miami, the cold reality of poverty is hard to ignore. For Randy Shannon, who grew up here, living in the now was the only way to survive. You take each day step by step. You don't try to push it. You don't try to look forward to the future. Because tomorrow is never there for you. It's just a chance that you may wake up tomorrow and it'll be there. When Shannon was two, his father was murdered, leaving Randy and his four siblings to be raised by their mother. I never had my dad. I did all the right things. I just held whatever my mom told me to do, I did. And that's how I ended up this way. In 1989, when he was 22, and had just ended his career as an overachieving UM linebacker, Shannon's older sister, JoJo, lost a battle with drug addiction and AIDS. It happened so fast. I think he handled it the way you would say, man, that I would want to handle it that way. You know, if it happened to me that way, I, I would like to have that type of strength. In 1990, Shannon was a 26-year-old defensive line coach under Dennis Erickson at Miami. That same year, Shannon's brother Donald died. Eight years later, his brother Ronald died. Both were drug addicts, and both died of AIDS. Growing up back then, the needles was involved, and they got into drugs heavily. They chose the other roads. Me, I was into sports. I seen the things that they get done and what happened to them, and I kept moving forward. And then when they passed away, each one of them told me, worry about me, I'm gonna be okay. Make sure you take care of mom. So I moved forward. On the day Donald was buried, Shannon was preparing for Miami's upcoming game. He slipped into a suit in the Miami locker room and told Erickson he'd be back before practice. I really didn't know where he was going, and, and we weren't really aware of what was happening, and then all of a sudden he's gone and he's back in practice. What I thought was, how is he reacting to this thing? I mean, it's, uh, it hurt him so deeply, yet uh, he went to the funeral and then came back and, and did what he loves to do, and that's coach. Bang, move, let's go. Well, I can't change anything that happens like three seconds ago. But sometimes when you plan certain things, things go happen the other way. And then a lot of people panic and go in a different mode. I don't. On athletes, come on. Shannon shares a special bond with his players. On, they talk quick. not just about ball, but about life. He doesn't share every detail of his life story, but they understand its depth. Nice job, K Rob. That's it. That's a nice job. He's really been like a father figure to a lot of players on the team, including myself. He can relate to the players in so many different situations. He grew up down here, you know, lost, you know, some family members. Just, he just know how it is, you know, being raised and playing down here. You look like me when I was young. I don't like, I want them to feel comfortable that they got a coach when I was a coordinator and also now I'm the head coach. That's this guy's gonna be in their corner. There's a lot of people that go through what, what he went through and don't end up like Randy Shannon. You know, Shannon still has to carry with him at all times copies of his fingerprints in case there's a case of mistaken involving his one living sibling, his brother Pee Wee, who's been arrested several times. But Shannon says he would never turn away from his brother. He could not turn his back on a brother. And Shannon, known for tremendous loyalty and strength, he's got a connection with his team like very few. He beat them as a head coach in Owen Field. And there you see dressed out and very sharply attired for his game. He's got five new assistants on his staff, including offensive coordinator Patrick Dix. Got to get a big improvement in that area. Jimmy Dykes with the latest on this ballgame joins us now from Norman. Jimmy? 
Jimmy Dykes in Norman, Oklahoma, where the Miami hurricane might feel right at home today. The local forecast has been described as a tropical atmosphere, a 100% chance of rain. Both coaching staffs have told me, though, they feel confident they can move the football up and down this field if they can keep the ball dry in the pre-snap routine. Oklahoma actually ended their practice on Thursday with the skill guys dropping footballs in buckets of water and handling them in skill drills. Miami obviously used to tropical atmosphere. The weather, big part of this ball game today. Back to you. Remnants of a hurricane literally in town along with the Miami Hurricanes. Mm. You talked to Randy Shannon on the eve of this real big game. Where, where is his head, Kurt? Well, first I thought that was a great, a, a great feature to illustrate why Randy Shannon will bring the Canes back to being a dominating team once again in college football. He relates to these players. He has a way of motivating these players that I think is an outstanding way of, uh, of doing it the right way, especially uh, at that the game today. This is an opportunity for the Canes, a big opportunity. After four straight years of going to BCS Bowl games, the last three years have not been that good. Now they go to Norman, number five Sooners. The matchup of the day, not just, maybe, maybe one of the best matchups of the year, will be Oklahoma's offensive line, how physical they are going up against the Miami defense that's as good as you're going to see in college football. One thing about Oklahoma is they're physical. Kevin Wilson demands that from the offensive line. And DeMarco Murray's back that we saw last week to get Alan Patrick and how tough he can run comes back to this game. If you crowd the line, Ta think about taking away their ability to run the football. You leave one-on-one -on -one opportunities on the outside for Malcolm Kelly and Juan Keen and Glacius. And right here, Glacius makes a play. One-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside. He can, of course, make you pay for that. That's the matchup today. Miami's defense, very athletic, very physical, determined to stop that physical attack from Oklahoma. The difference today is Miami's offense is not ready for this outing, in my opinion. They're still growing and kind of trying to create an identity. Miami comes in to brawl. They're ready to fight. Yeah. But their offense is not quite ready to knock off the Sooners. Oklahoma wins at home. Good points. And I tell you what, I like this Miami defense, and they got a chance. But let me tell you something. If they do have a chance, it's going to have to play because they play great defense, and they keep the score like a baseball score. That's the only way they can win. Now, let's watch the way they play defense. Therese McCray, number 54, is a monster on the inside. Nice player. 52, Traveris couldn't. Likes to move around, get good athletic ability, can catch the ball, and then score with it when he does. I like the fact that Miami is going to come in there aggressive and really go after him. But I think that's also their main problem. I think Oklahoma has the best all-around personnel in the country for what I've seen on film. They're a great football team in every area. They're going to load up Miami is and over the top. Over the top. Oklahoma wins this one even in the rain with long passes. Yes. Big. Two good big. defenses. Two very good defenses. Two inexperienced quarterbacks that both use great, talented but, you know, young running backs yeah. and rain. Hey, I don't know. It could be, it could be interesting. I think, interesting yeah. watch. Yeah, it will. I think, I think it'll be a good game. We got a lot of good games coming up, Lee, coming up. Way through the show right now. Only halfway? Chris asked for some upsets. Only halfway. Well, we may have some upsets coming up here. You and I will pick some big ones coming up later. Well, forced to wear leg dresses as a two-year-old, LSU's Glenn Dorsey believes that that helped make him a superstar. Don't touch that dial. It's a... <laughs> you could not play a game during the day. You could oh, not play a day game kidding? in this environment. No chance. Goodness. Well, you could get online, ESPN.com, or text CDD, CDG to ESPN, and you can help sh you know, shape which game Lee and Kirk are going to pick at the end of the show here. Those are your four options. Alabama had the early lead. NC State, Boston College making a comeback. Still plenty of time to vote. Well, we'll talk about the West Coast, a conference that uh, less for a conference that gets no respect from these fans right here. Big signature win by Cal over Tennessee. But they, they took a setback on Thursday night, frankly, as Oregon State picked fifth in the conference, went to uh, Cincinnati out of the Big East and got smacked. There's an interesting games, I think, involving Pac-10 teams today, a chance to snap some long winning streaks by some teams. Now, number 14, UCLA, 13 on our poll here, hosts BYU with the Bruins' Ben Olsen, redshirted before a two-year Mormon mission. Makes his uh, debut against BYU. First game in a very good defense. Cook's defense under Bronco Mendon also very good. Smothering Pac-10 offenses the last couple of games. Oregon and Arizona. They arrive as underdogs with an 11-game winning streak. BYU is a better team, especially on defense, than most people realize. What do you think about the game in Pasadena today? Well, I, UCLA has 20 returning seniors. Has a lot of experience. And he talked about Ben Olsen, unheralded quarterback. I like UCLA, but it's closer than the experts think. Ellis, 
I think they win the game. Well, the, the one thing about UCLA is they have great athletic ability, yep. great experience. I think this might be one of those games where the underdog has a chance to win this game. Max Hall, the quarterback from BYU, got off to a great start last week. I, d I doubted BYU last week. I'm going to I'm going to pick them this week to knock oh, off the Bruins. Okay. Okay. BYU. Well, welcome, welcome to the bandwagon. Yeah, week good. one, kid. What do you want? That's a good team that did look very good in the opener was Dennis Erickson and Arizona State. Sparky hosting Ralphie here. Rudy Carpenter against San Jose State. I know it wasn't the greatest competition, but they're not that bad. 13 of 17 converting on third down. It's going to be tough for the Buffs to get him off the field. And one of the few Buffs difference makers, Hugh Charles, the running back, out with a hamstring. So, figure the running game will be MIA. That is a that is a strong prediction tonight. So what, what do you think about the ball game? Well, I picked Arizona State to be the surprise team in the nation for me. I'm telling you, I'm not changing my mind. They got good offensive balance. I tell you what, I said it at the beginning. I'll say it again. They'll were, they will win the first seven games. I think I think that's very very uh, fair, and I think it's it's a chance to happen. A big win today for them. The balance of the offense that Dennis Erickson has brought in. Uh, you have an experienced quarterback in Rudy Carpenter. I think it's a big win today, and the best receiver Rudy Burgess comes back. So I, I like Arizona State. Meanwhile, in Washington, they're trying to create the tougher environment, kind of resurrect that. They're trying to get better off the win at Syracuse. They host Boise State, which has a 14-game winning streak. It's the first ever meeting. The first home start for the anointed savior, Jake Locker. Led UW to that blowout at Syracuse. He's a very good runner, working to improve his passing. An excellent baseball guy. But whether or not that arrives today against Boise State and their high-powered offense, that's another question. Can they slow down Boise State enough to win? Is Cinderella still alive? Maybe. Uh, because Washington scored five straight times. They got into the red zone, all touchdowns. I like this Washington club. They're going to beat Boise. I like Washington, too. Five, state, five straight times against... Syracuse, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think Washington, the quarterback's the real deal. I agree with Tyrone Willingham. He's a franchise quarterback you can build around for the next few years in recruiting. Rank and rank against Syracuse. This is the day Boise State steps out of a big win against Oklahoma, and they show the country that before Oklahoma game last year, they're a really solid program, and after the Oklahoma game, they're a really solid program. Yeah. Boise State takes it to Washington. This wouldn't oh, have the same national impact as beating Oklahoma, but it's a, it could be a quality win if Boise State can do he, it. He's dying. He what? says what? the street well, stops. Well, they are favorites. I just yeah, don't want to yeah. say that. I just I, I'm just saying. People, Washington in an upset. There you go. Memo. Boise State, Syracuse, same colors. They look the same, kind of the same, but different team. Whole different no, a team. A little attitude on Boise. A little attitude. Yeah. All right, we'll come back. A record 11 <laughs> games will be picked by these guys. We'll see if we have a little more upset. That was a mild one. Yeah, a mild one. What do you mean? That's at least an upset. That's a good one. I picked one there. <laughs> I did. Why you over UCLA? Well, we'll see if the, the Mighty Gators and their Tim Tebow might be an upset alert. Most believe their season starts in a couple of weeks, and their former coach, Steve Spurrier, down at South Carolina, trying to inspire his team and his fans as they visit Georgia tonight. Talk a lot more about Corso and his role in the inspiration. Back to our first visit to Baton Rouge in three years. As always, they love the purple and gold tonight. Supremely confident. These folks don't really believe that Virginia Tech, with that offense, presents much of a test in this ACC versus SEC game. There are a couple of conference games we'll talk about in just a second. Non-conference games for SEC teams. Southern Mississippi visits Tennessee. And the Trojans of Troy, who are respectable, very yeah. respectable, for three quarters against Arkansas Lee. Troy scored 17 points in the second half, of, in the second quarter against Arkansas. They did it by throwing the ball. Florida's defense Defensive secondary will be tested because they have not been good yet. They need to be exposed. Watch out. I'm telling you, these guys can throw the football. Hey, maybe watch out for Coach Nick Saban because he get his conference opener. The I, think, I think this is a potential upset alert. Chris Nixon can throw the football. Earl Bennett's his primary target. Vanderbilt Stadium lulls the powerhouse to sleep in the SEC. It feels like a spring game. <laughs> and I think it's a huge opportunity for an upset. John Parker Wilson better have the Crimson Tide ready to play. The spring game drew 92,000, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Auburn off the narrow escape versus K State host dangerous dog South Florida. Quentin Groves and that defense is carrying the team. Number 54 needs two sacks. It's Matt Grothy. His mobility is hampered to become the all-time sack leader. That's cool. Tough task, but the Bulls are pretty good. They're 
Not bad. Well, they've been improving. This is only their 10th year of Division I football. You think about what they did last year. They went to Morgantown and shocked the world by beating the Mountaineers. By the way, they beat Louisville two years ago. They've got some experience coming back, which will help them this year to be a threat in the Big East. Matt Grothy, the quarterback last year, was second in the Big East in total offense as a freshman, comes back for his sophomore year. And Ben Moffitt will be all over the field today for the Bulls. He is not only an athletic guy, but I think he kind of carries that the swagger and the attitude of nobody really respecting South Florida. Florida. So this is a program only they've only been playing football for 10 years, yeah. five years in Division 1A. It's a middle of the pack, most believe, Big East team. They're not a very big underdog, though, at Auburn. Do they have a chance? Is he going to step out there and pick well, an upset? They got a good chance. So let me tell you about it. Auburn is a really classy team at home. I'll tell you what thing. Last week they won in the fourth quarter with two touchdowns, and they do it with a kid named Wes Byram. He's a superstar in the making with field goals. I like Auburn to win this game closer than the extra think, experts think, but I like field goals from Auburn. You know, the thing that I think is going to kill or kill the chances of South, uh, South Florida winning this game is everybody's been talking about it. Yeah. Everybody's been alerting <laughs> Auburn and warning them to look out for South Florida. They're a good team. And I think just that, that fact, yeah. I think, will bring Auburn to this game ready to play. Auburn's defense, led by Groves, the defensive end who's as good as their age in college football, they will get after South yeah. Florida. The offense from Auburn, Chris, they still have problems. They're Field still looking. Yeah, they're going to have to have special teams because that Field offense is not dangerous at all. Yeah, yeah. the Auburn faithful not looking past this game it's a big weekend down there how big the velcro pygmies are playing at the fiji house oh wow and then, oh. then delicious the lead singer is a solo gig at the supper club so it's a big I, weekend down there it's foreign it's, language it's a, i have no right. idea huge no, game either. in the sec <laughs> tonight it's the annual opener for cocky visiting ugga dogs d impressive versus high octane oklahoma state eight new starters from that group that dealt spurrier the second ever shutout loss last year 18 nothing gamecocks always struggle versus georgia last 10 meetings have they scored within 17 points now blake mitchell the quarterbacks come off suspension tonight for south carolina to give spurrier some leadership there but another concern louisiana lafayette from these parts ran right through spurrier's defense for 252 yards he called his defense average stiffs after the game they're going to be tested by thomas brown and now Sean Moreno, the freshman running back, even though Craig Lumpkin is out with the thumb, Georgia will still run the ball. The loser tonight is in trouble in this division race. And Spurrier trying to rally the home sport. He's trying to build belief behind his team by focusing on our man in the middle right here who had the audacity or the common sense to say Spurrier repeatedly in the last couple of years would never win an SEC title. No, you're going to get to see a treat here. It's part of a video they actually play in the Jumbotron before home games. So but I don't think Steve Spurrier can win the national title here or the SEC, and I'm going to tell you why. You can't recruit to this school consistently enough to beat Tennessee. Brown going to set it up on the right hash mark. Snap it back to him. Set it down. Kick it up. Strong kick. Headed towards it. It's good. It's good. To beat Florida. And I formation. Hand off left side. Determined. Go run. He gets even touch. Earning. It's no good! No good! I don't think Spurrier wins the SEC or national title. I don't care if he coaches here 400 years. We've already shown Corso we can beat Tennessee, Florida, Arkansas, and a lot of good teams. We've shown Corso that we can recruit number four in the nation by ESPN.com. Now let's show Corso we can build the facilities that are necessary. Let's show my pal Lee Corso we can win the SEC championship. The game is on. <laughs> Wonderful. They ran the football. Stafford threw it really well. They got a good offensive balance. They played 14 freshmen. And Georgia beat Oklahoma State with 14 freshmen. They'll beat South Carolina today with 14 freshmen. <laughs> Period. <laughs> How do you feel about all that stuff? You look like you're you look like you're ready to cover a kickoff, Fred. You don't dignify this stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, in this case, is I want to see if South Carolina, the strength of the team is supposed to be their defense and ability to stop the run. Last week against, got to make this sure I got this school right, Louisiana Lafayette, <laughs> 265 yards rushing that they allowed last week. And this is the strength of the team. I think Georgia's going to run the football. I think Georgia's going to throw the football with Matthew Stafford. And as Lee said, that Georgia defense, give oh. Mark Richt a lot of credit when it comes to recruiting personnel to fit their scheme. I think Georgia wins this game rather handily. Yes. Rather handily. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Game is on, huh, Lee? Remember, oh. the, the, the Georgia's win, <laughs> Georgia's win over South Carolina was the only win in the Eastern Division last year. They were one and four after that. So a lot of football to be played, but it's a very important game. We'll see. All right.
The man's got a red rear end. I love it. Let's go to Columbia. Jimmy Clausen this week for the Irish. But it'll mean victory against Penn State. Lee and Kirk on the same page on that one. We'll find out. After losing to Happy State to kick off the season, what's it going to take to turn things around in Ann Arbor? The friends share some ideas. Great car is not producing. Enough is enough, man. This, he's not going to get fired. But I wish he had the decency to... Uh... Another reminder before the big ball game in Baton Rouge, Notre Dame and Penn State starts the doubleheader at 6 o'clock Eastern time. The terrific atmosphere in Happy Valley and the first career start for Jimmy Clausen. There have been so many classics in this rivalry. It's the first visit by Notre Dame since 1991. In 92, though, with the snow flying in South Bend, Virgin. Rick Meyer to Reggie Brooks in the corner. Irish win at 17-16. Now, two years earlier, it was Penn State with the upset. Craig Fayak splits the uprights, 24-21 lead. They upset Notre Dame on the road. Three years before that, back in 87, Anthony Johnson punches it in for the one. Lou Holtz decides to go for the two-point conversion and the win, the gamble. But Tony Rice is stuck short of the goal line. Notre Dame loses it 21-20. Now, last year's meeting in South Bend was not exactly a classic. This was a behind-the-woodshed beatdown. Brady Quinn went crazy. Of course, he's gone. Samarge is gone. New offense. Anthony Morelli, who had an awful game, is back. He wants to atone for things. A turnover right there. They had a fake punt. A fake punt called by Weiss up 27-3 late in the third quarter, and they're still talking about that one in Happy Valley. To help build the spirits, they'll honor the national championship team in the silver anniversary of 1982. Our guy Todd Blackledge will be there for that one. The crowd will wear all white, pom-poms waving, Edmonton Oilers style. Redemption is on the mind of the Lions. Turno believes that big things are possible for his team. He loves the cohesion. He loves the chemistry. For the Irish, for the next five, we're on the road. Urgency to stop the bleeding immediately. But despite the total ineptitude in all phases by Notre Dame, Jopa says he's far too old and cagey to be fooled. So I think we're in a little better shape. Uh, the only thing that bothers me right now going into this football game is people don't realize how good Notre Dame is. I mean, that's the, that, score, that score is not anywhere indicative of, of what happened. No disrespect to Penn State, because I think that's a very fair question, because I think it's almost uh, almost entirely about us. You know, you still obviously have a good team you're going against that just came, is coming off a 59 to nothing, you know, win. But realistic issue, the bigger issue in, internally is us. Well, let's talk about them. They had 6-3 yep. in ounce. They had negative 8 yards rushing, gave up 9 sacks, 122 total yards. Now, maybe Penn State's defense isn't as good as Georgia Tech's, but they're still pretty good, and they're very hungry after last year's debacle. I, I think they are as good as Georgia okay. Tech's. I, I, I think Penn State, I said before the season, I think Penn State has a chance not only to win the Big Ten, but if they can go to Ann Arbor in a few weeks and win, they got a shot to get undefeated at the end of the season. This is a very good team with now an experienced quarterback, but it's, today it's about their defense and their ability to confuse a young quarterback and and, you know, that's the one thing when you're young and you're on the road, you've got to look into the eyes of this defense. Now, this is last year in a bowl game. You can see the blitz look. They come after him. They get pressure on Eric Ainge last year. And here is it, virtually the same look. They're going to blitz. Here they come. Linebackers are up. This is what the quarterback's going to have to deal with today. All of a sudden, they drop back in coverage. Offensive line is confused. They put pressure on Ainge. The linebacker's sitting there. And that's what Tom Bradley, the defensive coordinator from Penn State, is going to do. He's going to try to play with the mind of the young quarterback in Jimmy Clausen. And if you want to watch something in my opinion in this game it's Notre Dame's ability or inability to run the football if they can't run in this game to take the pressure off of Clawson it's a four touchdown loss for Notre Dame and that's what I think will happen I think they'll struggle today on the road with the young quarterback they're fired up <laughs> with the young quarterback and with that Penn State defense and Morelli big day I like the Lions well you know Penn State's offensive coordinator Galen Hall opened up the tack last week they had 549 yards throwing and running they got to do the same thing against the Irish now the key guy in this thing will be Anthony Morelli the quarterback now remember one thing last week Morelli threw for 295 yards three touchdowns career high the interesting thing about this is Morelli threw to eight different receivers. He spread the ball around really, really well, and I think that's going to help him. Now, Penn State's got to keep that wide open attack. Yeah. And remember one thing, redemption. Penn State was embarrassed 
Last year, 41-17. Watch out, 41-17. Penn State wins it this year. Because there might be a tendency when you expect like your defense to be real conservative. You say Penn State cannot do that. No, not do that. No, I don't your know. Ball off the field, yeah. right? Yeah. You guys are riding off Notre Dame a little too quickly. I think maybe may overrating Penn State just a touch. We'll I, see. I, I, there's I, a lot we'll of say, football. We'll see. I like this. He had a double knot so fast. Is that a double knot? No, I, it's okay. not, I, I'm, I'm with Lou. I'm, I'm going to like hedge and haw and ham. I'm not, I'm not going to pick the upset, but I think it's not going to be a beat down. They've had a very, very good week of practice at Notre Dame. Okay. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, the LSU band has showed up. They're ready to go. The folks trying to survive this unbelievable humidity. I mean, thank you for being here. Uh, coming up, we mentioned Michigan lost last week. Yeah, no, they, they, they were shocked by Appalachian State. Can they bounce back? These guys don't think the Irish will. Can the Wolverines? Let's talk about the Oregon game. We'll hear from head coach Mike Pilate. We wired him for sound as the Ducks head to the big house trying to pull the upset. Come on, D-line. Come on, D-line. Legal procedure on the O, quit moving. Metal, metal, metal. Today's Gillette Game Face is brought to you by Gillette Fusion. Upload a picture or video showing your game face, and you could win FaceTime with Brady Quinn or other great prizes. Visit GilletteGameFace.com and keep watching for details. Gillette game faces the LSU band, which is somehow managing to survive the heat in those uniforms. You're going to paint your face today. You better choose the paint wisely because it would be a sloppy puddle. Ten now, Ohio State fans, nobody loves this show more, but you got Akron today. It's part of that Y A W N season. Up. We'll get, we'll see you in a couple yeah, weeks, yeah, right? Okay. Wisconsin, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. Michigan, though, continues to be a story because what happened last week and what's happened the last three games for the Wolverines. You know what happened in Columbus? They came pretty close to beating the Buckeyes and playing for a national title, but it didn't happen. Close doesn't count. Close is not good enough. Then they went to the Rose Bowl and it wasn't close. USC just took it behind the woodshed, embarrassed the Michigan defense for the second consecutive game. And then, of course, the block field goal hurled around the world. The loss to Appalachian State, the stunning loss to the 1AA team. It's the 50th team in 1A since 1978 to lose to a 1AA team. Only four of the previous 49 went on to have winning seasons. So Lloyd Carr knew coming into the season because of the fact that in the last five years, if you take the two games at the end of the season, those 10 games, Michigan is 2-8. and eight. He knew there was going to be heat on him throughout the season. He just didn't expect it to start this soon. Here's the week that was in Ann Arbor, beginning with a stunning loss. This is absolutely unbelievable. That's good to hold. Oh, kick. Oh, the kick is oh, The Mountaineers have just beat the Michigan Wolverines. The biggest upset in Michigan football history. This is certainly um, a disappointment, a big disappointment. We just were not a well-prepared football team, and that's my responsibility. Boy Carr is not producing. It just seems, you know, terrible that you can't get prepared for, you know, what you call a cupcake game. Enough is enough. It's just a disgrace to the Big Ten. Lloyd Carr needs to be fired. He's not going to get fired, but I wish he had the decency to resign. That's, that's just insane. Coach Carr's not going anywhere. Well, I'm not getting into those issues. I have no concern about any of them. We love our fans, but as a team, we don't worry about what our fans are saying about us. We're thinking, you know, we're, we're playing for each other. We're playing for this team. I don't think people are expecting much of us, you know? I think I think a lot of people are expecting us to tank it. Our team's coming out of here to fight, and uh, you're not going to see a team that tanks it this year. What? Not expecting much. They're preseason number five. They picked the favorites of the Big Ten. Big Ten. People were expecting a lot. Now, what do you expect them to do after this, this shocking loss? Well, first of all, I'm Lloyd Carr, and this is my team. I get them in a room, no coaches, lock the door, and I say to them, look, we've been playing football for over 120 years. You wear the most famous helmet in college football. You are the winningest football program in America. You got Michigan pride. Now get out there and show them what you got. 
You ready? I'm ready. Yeah, that was good. I was getting caught up in the moment there. I, you know, the, the one thing, I, I would take that speech, and I would go have a players-only meeting, because i got to be honest with you. As a former player, I, I look at what's happened in these last six or seven days, and if I'm a Michigan player, there was so much talk in June, July from Jake Long, from Mike Hart, from Chad Henney. We came back in our, for our senior year to beat Ohio State to win a national championship. One of two things is going to happen after you lose a game like last week. You're either going to become divided and a case of senioritis will set in and you're looking for the draft or kind of a circle the wagons and us against the world mentality. But those seniors, the Michigan seniors, should be embarrassed for the way the media has torn apart their coach. They should be foaming at the mouth to have a chance to get back on the field and get after Oregon. I got to believe it's the Ladder. Exactly. I gotta believe that they're gonna circle the wagons and come out fighting. They should be embarrassed. I want to add one thing. You and I both know Michigan recruits good football players and good, good character. people. Yeah, good Aren't character. Right, they do. They'll yeah. be back. Yeah. They should. Well, if you go the other way too, it's what unpredictable. Yeah. Good sure. psychological implications yeah. Yeah. here. Of course, there are plenty of precedents for teams that stumbled early and then still were able to achieve their goals. You can flash back to 88 and Bo's team opened 0 and 2. They won the Rose Bowl. Of course, they didn't lose to Appalachian State. And these teams were showing you they didn't lose to one double A team. They lost to, you know, very, very highly ranked teams. Colorado lost to David Carr, came back and won the Big 12 six years ago. So the first obstacle after that big loss is Oregon. And they come into the big house and they bring a, an athletic quarterback in Dennis Dixon who saw what Armani Edwards of Appy State did last week. He broke open a close game with his speed against Houston. And we know how Michigan's been hurt in the past by guys like Vince Young in the bowl, Troy Smith, Drew Stan. So does Mike Bellotti. He's trying to get his offense ready for this defense. Let's go now and get it going. Get somewhere in a hurry. Got to work at it now. Eyes up. Let's go. Patrick Chung, you playing this week? Yeah. All right. Just checking. <laughs> Big receivers this week. Got to D them up. Hustle off. Let's go. Make sure we're seeing the signals. Legal procedure on the O. Quit moving. Metal, metal, metal. Come on, D-line. You're going to see that a bunch this week. Finish. Here we go. Finish. Finish. That's Gary Croton left up there. He's down here calling plays for LSU, but they're still running that very difficult offense for Michigan to stop. It's a long list of guys who have burned Michigan with that style. Can Oregon do it today? That's a good point because the bad news for Michigan is that Oregon uses the same offense that Appalachian State did to score 34 against them. Not good. But I'll tell you one thing, this is going to be a different Michigan defense. But now they're going to have to watch out for Dixon. The guy can throw the football like a shot. He has good vision. He also can run it. And this is the thing that might hurt Michigan if they're not ready. But I cannot believe that they had a week to get ready and they won't be ready for this offense. I would not be surprised to come back. Now, the good news for Michigan is that Houston had 500 and 45 yards of total offense and scored 27 points. I think that Big Blue comes back. They're going to have to outscore them, but I think Michigan rebounds and wins big. You know, Lee, what I'm excited to see is there's been so much talk this week about Michigan and re rebounding. What are they going to do and how are they going to respond? I got to tell you, Oregon, guys, it's been about six years since you really mattered in the landscape in college football. You got to go back to Joey Harrington's era when Oregon every single year was a top 10 type of team. This is a golden opportunity for a Pac-10 team to showcase their mm -hmm. ability, much like Cal did last Saturday. Can Oregon take advantage of the opportunity and show America that they mean business this year? I think they'll show up ready to go. Unfortunately, they're coming into a hornet's nest, and they're taking on a Michigan team that's tired of hearing about Appalachian State, and they want to get back out of the field. That's why I think Oregon comes to play. Yep. Dennis Dixon will make plays running around, but at the end of the day, Michigan at home will be ready to go. go not, enough, not enough defense for the Ducks who got burned by Houston. Give up a lot of yards. Different formations Houston used and Michigan. Do you think Oregon will too soft? Yeah, I, think, I think Mike Hart will have a big game. Oh, yeah, you make a great ball. point. Yeah. I mean, Oregon gave one of the all-time don't show up, don't care, lackadaisical bowl Absolutely. efforts I've yeah. ever seen in yeah. the last season. They yeah. should make this entire it's season it's about big, showing yeah. the care and having yeah. redemption. Go blue. Well, we'll focus on LSU and Virginia Tech coming up. And as if the super stud Glenn Dorsey needed more motivation, more reason to play angry tonight against the Hokies. One of the alignment for Tech gave him a reason to. We'll feature the story of Mr. Dorsey ahead. It really is a great story. Leg braces at the tender age of two. But he came back, built himself under the best defensive player in the country. It's an amazing journey, and it's next. And another coach wired for sound. Go behind the scenes with the Hokies offense. So they have enough tonight to move the ball and score. Good, good.
good, good. Yeah, we're coming. Y'all sit tight. Gonna shake you up. Yeah, gonna have a good time. Oh, 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 <laughs> They're fast, fierce, nasty, mean-spirited, aggressive, and very deep, that LSU defense. Now, Virginia Tech also has a very good defense. Historically, these are the two best defensive programs in the country in recent years. LSU, though, based on the opening week performance, a better offense. Virginia Tech, what was wrong in the opener against East Carolina? Was it the emotion of the moment too much? Was East Carolina a better defense than we expected? Well, trying to get to the bottom of it this week is offensive coordinator Brian Steinspring. Let's go now. Let's have a good day today. Good day to get it out here and get better. Come on, come on, come on. Punch! <laughs> Bring your big boy pads and create some space. Hey, quick! Move faster. They're gonna play fast. You gotta play fast with them. All right, here we go. Let's see how good we are in this one. Come on, come on, come on. Let's go, let's go, go. Gotta catch them all. Bam, let's go. Hit and catch it. Run into it. Good. Gotta expect those tags now. Somehow, Sergio Render, the guard of the Hokies, is filled with confidence despite the fact that they blocked no one last week. I'm not going to back down. Both of us put on our pants the same way. Talking about Dorsey. I feel like I can get my hands on him. I can put him on the ground. By the way, he's a player. Anybody can be pancaked, and I'm going to try my best to make sure that happens this Saturday. Talking about big old number 72 that everybody has problems blocking. He would have been one of the top draft picks in the NFL last year, but he wasn't 100% healthy, so he came back. He wanted to be in a position of power for this year's draft. Should be a very early pick. Now, stop me if you've heard the one about the Southern boy who spent part of his youth in leg braces, but then emerged to suddenly run very fast. Not talking about Forrest Gump. That, that was a pretty good story, but Glenn Dorsey's story is even better because, as Steve Cyphers reports, it's also true. That's what separates him. A motor that powers him, drives him to the ball. Sometimes I'll be surprised at myself. Much of that just come from doing whatever it takes to get to the ball. And, and sometimes I go back and watch him like, Anticipation of the ball. Oh, my goodness. He's extremely explosive. Um, he gets a point A to point B very quickly. Glenn Dorsey shows you why he is a All-American. I can tell you that uh, he's as good a defensive lineman as, as I've been around. Even more impressed with Dorsey, the football player, is his mother, because she remembers how it all began. Could you believe he couldn't hardly walk when he was two because he wore braces? I mean, and just to look at him now, you would be surprised to know that he wore braces as a kid. I don't really know the, the scientific or the medical term. I know I was bow leg, you know, and my, I know my toes pointed at each other, you know. So the bowed legs and crooked feet of the toddler were confined to corrective braces for more than a year. I remember my cousin not wanting to hold me because I was cutting my arms up with, uh, with the braces, you know. Uh, I remember just sitting around while everybody else was doing things, you know, and I, I don't think I ever forget that. Was there ever a time when a mom felt for him so much that you wanted to cry? Yes, yes, a lot of times, but I wouldn't let him it though. Uh, at night after he'd go to sleep or whatever, I would really pray and just think about it and just hope and pray that he would uh, come through it all, you know, with no problem. By the time he was seven, Dorsey's legs were straight enough to play football. But in the early years of competing in weight-restricted leagues, size became an issue for the opposition's parents. I didn't think I was big when I was small. The parents did, though, because I remember their parents used to weigh me for every game. The whole team would run laps with me extra, you know, after practice and stuff like that, just to prepare for the weigh-ins, you know, so it was, it was, it was cool. He even weighed naked <laughs> without any clothes on, just to make sure he would reach that weight limit. Today, fully clothed, at 6'2", 300 pounds, the Tigers' defense. A man whose character, the coaches say, was likely shaped in his boyhood. I suspect that, you know, he looked you know, longingly at uh, some things that maybe some other kids could do and, you know, really strive to do those, learn to work harder maybe than some of the other guys. And then when his body caught up, uh, he never lost sight of, you know, what got him there. How would you be different had you never had the braces? Maybe I wouldn't be able to, to overcome so many things. Maybe I wouldn't, you know, 
be able to take adversity and make it right, you know, and, and not and I might let it beat me down or something like that, you know. I was blessed to be around some good people, and I'm blessed to be with people now who wouldn't accept anything from me but the best. Well, if a defensive guy could be a Heisman candidate, it might be number seven. As the Heisman goes to the pretty boys. <laughs> like our Desmond here, one of the, one of the pretty boys. Pretty boy. he, I tell you what, he's up for every other award out there. It'd be tough enough if it was, if it was just blocking yeah. number 72. The problem is, you got Tyson Jackson, you got depth, you got guys you've never heard of back there. It's an unbelievable defensive line across the front. Well, you know, what makes this very interesting is when you come in and really get a chance to get to know these players and you talk to the coaches. Bo Pelini tells me that going to practice every day, as good as this LSU defense is, is they're actually a pleasure to work with because they want to continue to get better. And while Dorsey gets most of the attention, as Chris just said, if you pay too much attention to Glenn Dorsey, then there's so many other players that can make you pay for it. Here's Glenn Dorsey putting pressure last week on poor old Michael Hennig. Time after time, oh. Hennig was on his back. Now, here's an example. If you put two blockers like this on, on Glenn Dorsey, look who it frees up. You have guys all over the field in this front seven. In this case, it's Allie Hahn, who can come around and make a play. So Virginia Tech coming in into tonight's game. They're going to try to mix this game plan up, try to run, try to throw. The only chance they have to be able to be consistent on offense with the crowd and all the distractions is to mix up the play calling and being being balanced enough, Des, to try to slow down not just Glenn Dorsey, yeah, yeah. but the best defense in college football, all of his teammates around him. No, you're exactly right. And the defense have been getting a lot of credibility, a lot of publicity. I mean, more airplay than the Mary J. Blige song this week, and rightfully so. But I think when you know you have two good defenses who are going at it, you have to rely on field position. Any game that I've played in, the magnitude of this game, coaches will come up to me and say, hey, little big man, because that's what they call me, little big man. We're going to need you today. We want to shorten the field to give our opportunity, our offense an opportunity to score points. So I think guys like Early Doucette for LSU and Trendon Holiday and actually Eddie Royal from yep. Virginia Tech, those guys are going to be key players in tradition. Yep. Well, you're absolutely right on target, Desmond. Let me tell you why. Because I tell you what, if Virginia Tech has a chance to win this football game, there's two areas they can. Punt returns and kickoff returns and also defense. Keep it as a baseball score and you might be able to beat him. Uh, Eddie Royal can return punts. I'm telling you, the guy can fly down the sideline. And then I'll tell you what, they, they got a guy named Victor Harris. He drops back, got good hands, scores, gets a touchdown, looking good. Virginia Tech. Now, I, I know this from ex personal experience. Virginia, LSU has won 13 straight games here. Eight last year. And I coached against them here. And let me tell you guys something. You better be better than them to beat them in that place, or you won't. If you're even, forget about it. They're going to crush you. <laughs> There's that good in that place right there. Oh, has your prediction coming up. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Trendon Holiday, Desmond, the fastest man in college football. Keep an eye on him. Number eight, five foot five, ten oh two. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no way. Ten oh two. Ten oh two. Flat. He can flat out flat. That's, he makes you look slow. That's yes, world. Sir. That's world class. <laughs> they'll try to, they'll try to that, get him eight wow. to ten oh, touches two. against that. Defense. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> beat Xavier Carter's uh, time. You yes. give us a lane? Yes. What, what do we got yeah. coming up? Lou? All right, I'll tell you what we got. So what's it going to be? Am I going hokey or tiger? I'm all set. Nothing's going to change my mind. It's headgear time now. Don't you dare turn this television off. <laughs> College Game Day is built by the Home Depot. And in part by Miller High Life. Good, honest beer at a tasty price. And AT&T, the new leader in wireless. Saturday's selections are brought to you by Pontiac. Watch this season's best Pontiac game changes at ESPN.com. Keyword Pontiac. Since something the Irish has been a long offseason to build up the Tigers home opener. We'll have the pick on LSU and Virginia Tech coming up. But following us, Nebraska and Wake Forest to go there for a report in Aaron Andrews. CA. Chris, the Huskers are excited to have one of their top wide receivers in Maurice Purify back in action today. A tough offseason for their senior. He was arrested twice, suspended for seven weeks, including last week's game. And he's also grieving the loss of his brother, who was shot and killed two weeks ago. Purify told me yesterday he's really looking forward to playing in his five game with his new quarterback, Sam Kelly.
Keller and Credits Keller for getting him out of the house during his suspension. They would go to the field and work two to three times a week together. He said, I can't wait to be a part of this action. And of course, wishing his brother was here to see him. Aaron, thank you. Time now for our Pontiac game changing performers. We'll give, we'll give Kirk the win week one for Matthew Stafford. Who do you got here? Okay, I got Arizona State's running back Ryan Parade. Why the three, 230 pounds, scored three touchdowns last week. He's the best big back in America that nobody's talking about. He'll score and score and score today. This guy's a player, boy. Well, Leon, my Pontiac game changer is staying with the team of running backs Mike Hart. Michigan, if you have any guts, you have any class, any heart, Hard at all after the week you had, hand the ball up to Michael Hart and let him run the football. Get physical against that Oregon defense. Well, I'm going to go with Penn State's Dan Connor, one of the embarrassed Nittany Lion defenders about last year's beat down, gave up 41. Number 40, trying to chase down Jimmy Clausen, chasing down Paul Puzlozny's school record for tackles. He should be able to get it later this year. Very inspired Penn State defense. I'll go with Dan Connor. If you watch the games today, well, you can watch college football final tonight and see which four plays. Lee Kirk and I have selected as Pontiac game changing performer nominees. You go to ESPN.com and vote, and we'll have the winner for you at halftime of Thursday. Appalachian State, of course, won week one. All right, I have had it with the heat. Off comes this jacket. I'm going to roll up the sleeves. You're going to pick 11 games. All right, all Get right. rid of this thing. Okay, is, look at this. Go, ridiculous. all right. You, you guys ready to pick? Bonus. Give ready us to the pick bonus. Games? Yes, give it to us. Roll it. up the sleeves. ESPN.com bonus pick is Alabama and Vanderbilt, the conference opener for Nick Saban. What says you in Music City? Nick Saban is one of the best coaches in the entire country. Oh. I'm going Alabama. His whole shirt's actually oh, wet. Ridiculous. Uh, I think Vandy keeps it close because they're going to lull Alabama to sleep with that crowd. But Bama wins a close one, Elsie. Big. Lenore Ryan, Division Two, against one double-A Appalachian State. Cinderella goes to the dance and wins another one. Appalachian State. Yeah, Appalachian State. Georgia wants to put a hobnail boot up the backside of Spurrier between the hedges. Who wins the game tonight? Georgia's offensive balance wins this one in the fourth quarter. That's a nice football team, Georgia. Yeah, I think, I think Georgia's defense comes in and, and a good statement. I love Matthew Stafford. I think he plays very well again. Balanced attack from Georgia. All right, what about South Florida and Auburn? You smell an upset with the Bulls? No way, no way. Auburn is 12-1 and one at home at night. Ha! They kick ha! field goals and they win. Too much talk about South Florida yep. pulling off the upset. Auburn's alert and ready. Their defense alone wins this game. South Florida's a good team, but they're not going to pull off the upset today. All right, we'll see if Wake Forest can pull off the upset. A home dog. That game follows us in just a couple of minutes. Nebraska there. Nebraska is not looking to play Wake Forest. They're looking at USC next yep. week. That's why this one's much closer than the experts think. I also like your line. It's the smallest stadium they played smallest in. Smallest stadium in how they played in 36 years. Again, it's that same Alabama yeah. bandy. And they lull, get lulled to sleep. They're looking at USC. That's why it's closer. In Texas was shaky in the opener. This is the first meeting against TCU since the Southwest Conference dissolved here. Will be Big 12 officials today in Austin. What happened? Texas is losing going into the fourth quarter, but they throw really? the football and win a close game. Texas with the forward pass in the fourth quarter. TCU's defense will keep them interested and keep them in the game. Texas, again, much like Auburn's been hearing all about TCU, and the Horned Frogs don't have an offense to beat Texas. I like Texas. What about the defensive showdown starting at noon Eastern time over on ABC? Randy Shannon's first big test. Two great defenses. First meeting since the 80s. Miami and Oklahoma with ACC officials. The Canes bring their officiating crew. Well, I picked LSU you to play Oklahoma in a national title, so I got to go with LSU. I got to go with Oklahoma, too. Yeah, I have Oklahoma in a national championship as well. I think this could be the game of the day. Miami's out to try to showcase their new yeah. coach and their new team and with a new start against the number five team in the country, but I think Oklahoma's defense and offense is too good. Well, the world riding off Notre Dame in the long-awaited starting debut for Jimmy Clausen in Happy Valley tonight on ESPN. Payback! Ah. Revenge! 41-17, Penn State beats Notre Dame. Morelli, a huge day today. And the, other, and the other thing is, I think Jimmy Clausen will show some flashes of why he will eventually be a great quarterback, but not against uh, this Penn State defense tonight. I like Penn State big, very big. To so usually work the Notre Dame games. All right, what's next? Oregon and Michigan in the big house here. Big Ten officials in that game. Michigan, you got any Big Ten pride? 
Go blue. Michigan wins this one. Well, I, it's been all Big about 10. yeah, it's been all about Lloyd Carr and he LSU lost four picks to the first round of the NFL draft. Still preseason number two. That's historic. Are they overrated? Are they really that good? Can they get to the national championship game in their home state? A long conference season to go. But tonight is a major hurdle. Whether or not these fans or the players or the coaches believe there is supreme confidence down here that they can handle the Hokies. You can't pick the game. You're calling it tonight, but give me a key to the game. I think first of all, people are underestimating how good Virginia Tech's defense really is. But the key to this game, in my mind, is Sean Glennon. And the crowd behind us will fill up Tiger Stadium. How does Virginia Tech handle that atmosphere? And does Sean Glennon turn the ball over? Or is he able to play smart and efficient and manage the game? That's the key tonight. This is one of my favorite songs of all time. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. You ain't gonna beat these guys in this place unless you're maybe the New Orleans Saints. Give me the hand. <laughs> Go Tigers! You got them, Tigers! I'm not sure the way the Saints looked the other night. They could beat I, these I don't guys think in the here. Go Tigers! We'll see if the Florida Gators are the pick or if you put that head on in a few weeks. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy your football Saturday. We'll see you later on tonight for Virginia Tech at LSU following Notre Dame and Penn State. Up right now is Nebraska and Wake Forest. We're headed to the bus in the air conditioning. Enjoy your day. <laughs>